Deuteronomy 15, 12, if your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free. And when you send him away from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your wine press. From what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this thing today. And if it happens that this servant says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you at your house since he prospers with you. Then you shall take an awl and shall thrust it through his ear to the door and he shall be your servant forever. Also to your female servant, you shall do likewise. Amen. Lamb of God, speak to our hearts today. I want to go to the doorpost. I want to always walk with you based on a love and an adoration that I have for the things that are holy. Lamb of God, I ask you to move in our lives today. Let our motives be pure. Let our eyes not be dry. But God, let us assemble together and realize that you have brought us out of slavery. You have brought us out of bondage. And Lord, we owe so much to you today. And Lord, I ask you to take us one more time. Let us visit the doorpost. Let us visit the doorpost today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Here a little background. A man or a woman could at that time in history sell themselves as a slave. And I think it needs to be noted that every group of people that's ever lived on the face of this earth has been a slave at some point in time. Uh before the Africans were brought to this country and enslaved, which was a terrible thing, the, the Irish were actually slaves. And so uh, it, it is not a color thing. It is, it, it is a reflection of the cruelty and the depravity of mankind. But, but in this situation, these people were basically day labor, uh, but an extended situation because they actually could sell themselves into slavery because they needed a job. They were homeless. They were destitute. They didn't have family, possibly. And so they would uh, uh, come to a landowner. They would come to a person of, uh, 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 of substance and they would say, okay, I'm willing to sign a contract with you and I'm willing to serve you for a certain length of time. And, and so these people would come and they would uh, sell themselves on a contract, as it were, to serve because of difficulties that was in their lives. And hopefully after six years, they would be on their feet and they'd be able to do their own thing and, and uh, they'd be able to be established. And from that moment in time, they can decide whether uh, what they want to do. Do they want to stay or do they want to go? And so in the first part of the chapter, it speaks of the seventh year of release of debt, brother to brother, if he be poor. And so this theme of release is carried on in this story. And if a person has been a slave now for six years or, or on contract or agreement, in the seventh year they can go away freely. But not just freely, but when they would leave, they would be blessed. Uh, they would be given uh, a, 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 a departure or a severance, if you please. And, and so they were blessed to start another life. And the Lord said, now you remember, you were in, talking to the master. 
You were in, you were a slave in Egypt. Remember how that felt? So I want you to treat your brother, amen, with you in mind. Remember what you went through. And so whatever this man or this woman decides after the sixth year going into the seventh year that they want to leave, you make sure you bless them so they can start a new life. Amen. And so uh, they were blessed when they went to go leave. And when we read this chapter, there's so many levels of parallel that can apply to all of us today. We're all here tonight. Every one of us have a story. And we're all here because various events in our life has brought us to this place. Because, you know, naturally, it's not a part of our nature just to serve God. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we know there's a God and there's a space in our heart that only God can fill, but basically we are a selfish bunch. And, and we don't do anything unless it's something in it for us. And so every one of us, as you, if you was to stand up and testify, you could testify that something brought you here. Something brought you to the place where you actually was willing to surrender and submit your life to God. You tried everything and everything had failed. You tried drugs. You tried uh, relationships. You tried everything and this world let you down. And then you succumbed and you said, God, I'll try you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so God, we all have got a story. And the events that have brought each and one each one of us here tonight vary, but they all basically are the same. We had to come down to nothing. Amen. Amen. We had to come down to nothing before we would reach out to the Lord. Most of us. Amen. Hallelujah. We're all here tonight. We have a story, and each one is interesting, and the world needs to hear your story. Listen, it, it, you know, uh, it, 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 every person's story is unique. You can take the, listen, let me stop right here. You can take the same sermon and you can give the same sermon topic to a hundred preachers and listen to every one of them preach the same sermon and you'll get something different out of it. You know why? Because their personality is woven into that text. Their life story is woven into that text. And so everyone has something to add to the proclamation of what God has done and, 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 and talking about the goodness of God. Amen. Uh, my story is not yours, but that doesn't mean my story is better than yours. Uh, you have a circle of influence. Every one of us have a circle of influence. I cannot win or influence the people that you can. There's some people that will listen to you that won't listen to nobody else. There's people that you're related to. There's people that you work with. They are your circle of influence. And you have their ear. And you are able to speak into their life. And don't ever forget that that is your pulpit. That is your ministry. Every one of us are called of God to be in ministry. There's a five-fold ministry, but that five-fold ministry is for the perfection of the saints for their ministry. Every one of us are a preacher. Every one of us are to proclaim the goodness of God because every one of us has got a unique story. Don't ever let the devil tell you that you don't have nothing to say. Nobody will listen to you. The devil is a liar. The world needs to hear your story. Your brothers, your sisters, everybody needs to hear your story. Amen. Tell your story. Amen. And so their story had brought them to this place. Amen. It's your story. But it's not for you to keep. It's for you to tell somebody about it. The Bible tells us that Abraham followed God, but Lot, his nephew, followed Abraham. See, you could, e you could either 
follow God or you can follow a godly person. Uh, and uh, I, let me say this to our brethren. God never gave you a praying wife for you not to pray. God never gave you a wife that is an intercessor, amen, so you could sit and do nothing. Amen. And when it comes right on down to it, there was an old song they sang years ago, you got to walk that lonesome valley. You got to walk it by yourself. No, nobody else can walk it for you. You remember the old song? Some of you old enough, got a little gray hair going on here. Amen, praise God. Because see, no matter how great of a prayer warrior your wife is, brother, you've got to have a relationship with God. You can't go to heaven on her, uh, her, her coattail. Amen. And so Abraham loved God. Abraham followed God, but Lot followed Abraham. Amen. And hopefully, and we see that ultimately those roles kind of caught up with one another and Lot found his own relationship with God. And so I, I just don't want to be somebody that follows someone else's story. I, I got a story of my own. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And if you don't have a story today, you know why you don't have one? Because you haven't surrendered to the Lord. But if you surrender today, if you give Him your life, He'll give you beauty for ashes. He'll turn your life around and you will have a story. You know what your story will be? Once I was blind, but now I see. Praise God. Amen. Once I was a dope head, but now praise God. Hallelujah. I'm delivered. I am set free by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, uh, Abraham walked with God. And where are you and I in your walk with God today? Sometimes we need to revisit some landmarks. Sometimes we need to redig a well. Sometimes we need to, you know, here, here's what the apostle said. You know, and let, let me paraphrase this. Living for God is the simplest thing you'll ever do in your life. There is simplicity in living for God. But life and people will complicate your walk with God if you listen to them. Politics, things like this will, 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 will uh, complicate your walk with God. But brother, I tell you, every once in a while, I want to go back to laying on that little cot at grandma's house. Every once in a while, I want to go back to the place where I, where I played that little record. Hey, Amen. And listen, uh, as, uh, you know, someone to care. I want to go back to that place of tenderness. I want to go back to that place where I first fell in love with Jesus Christ. Hey, Amen. That's what I've got to do. Because that is where your joy is. That is where your strength is. It's in the simplicity in living for God. Don't let people, uh, or don't let yourself complicate your walk with God. Love the Lord with all of your heart. But, you know, I, I, at 38 years of pastoring, I have people come up to me. Brother Harvey, will I go to hell if I do this or do that? Brother Harvey, if I do this or do that, will I go to hell? And, and, and you know, and I listened to that for a while. And you know, you know what? I, I, after a while, I, I stopped. I said, "Brother, you're asking the wrong question. Why are you trying to find how close you can get to the line?" Why are you trying to get so close to the world that you're trying to find out what you can get by with instead of loving God? See, it's not about, will I go to hell if I do this or do that? That, that has nothing to do with anything. The question is, is, is it pleasing to God? And if I will live my life with that one definition, Whatever I am presenting to myself, uh, blessed is the man who is not condemned in the thing that he alloweth. 
Amen. I, when I come to that place and I, I've, I've got a situation in my life and I've got a question about it. Is this, uh, is this right or wrong? I just need to simply say, is this pleasing to the Lord? If he was sitting right here in person, would I be ashamed for him to see what I'm doing? What I'm reading? What I'm listening to? The entertainment that I'm allowing my liberty to take with? The question is, is it pleasing to the Lord? That's the simple answer. And, if, and anything outside of that is complication. Amen. I'm, we're, we are not. We, see, here's the thing about it. We are. Uh, we as apostolics, we're not interested in being religious. We're not interested in coming here and appearing to be something and not be that. We're, we're not here trying to come to a place on Sunday and try to convince ourselves and everybody else that we're living for God, then go home and live like a devil. Amen. We are born again of the water and of the Spirit and we are going to be the same person when we go home as we are right here. When I go to work Monday, I'm not going to be a different person. I'm going to be the same person I am right here. Amen. Praise God, somebody. And so the question is, is it pleasing to the Lord? Amen. Amen. Can any relation exist, grow, or be of any value at all if the affection only comes from one direction? If I, I hear so many people talk about the love of God, Jesus saved me. Oh, the grace of God saved me. Oh, love lifted me. And you know what I mean? Yeah, that is so true. But how about your love toward Him? No relationship can be complete with a one sided love affair. God, see, the fact that God loves me is not going to save me. The fact that I reciprocate that love is what's going to complete the package to where I will see the fruition of salvation. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He said to one bunch, he said, why do you tell me? Why do you say you love me and keep not my commandments? You know what he said then? He said, your actions prove that you are a liar. Boy, that's tough stuff, isn't it? Hallelujah. That's like saying you love your wife, but you're running around on her. Come on now. You may love her, but you love you more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you think, well, she'll always be there. Well, she may not always be there, brother. If she got any sense, she probably won't. Praise God. Yeah. Now I say that facetiously. You know, but the, but, but the thing is that our relationship with God has got to be a two-way street. It can't be, oh, oh, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And somewhere down the line, you've got to say, oh, I love Jesus. Yes, I love my Jesus. Uh, somewhere down the line, there's got to be a meeting. Amen. And so can any ex relationship exist if it's a one-way direction? This story has caused me to ponder this question a lot. In our reading here, it was actually a large cele cere ceremony that was held. It was pomp and circumstance. It, 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 was, it, it was there. And in the seventh year, there were two classes of servants that was dealt with. Those who would choose to walk away and they had, every, they had every right to walk away. Every one of us have a chance. If you want to walk away, this pastor can't help, can't stop you. This pastor can only pastor you by your consent. He can't force himself on you. The only way you can be pastor is to submit to and consent to that relationship to happen. 
Amen. Like we said this morning, a lot of people have a preacher in their life, but they don't have a pastor. You need to have someone that you are comfortable to share your soul with. And I'm not saying that a pastor is your salvation, but I'm telling you that God has ordained the office of a pastor. It is a delegated response, a delegated authority that God has given the ministry to help you and to nurture you in your walk with God. Hallelujah. And so uh, uh, these people at, into the seventh year, they could walk away if they wanted to. And, you know, there was nothing holding them there. And then there was the other group who chose to stay. I think from the outset that it's important to understand in the Scriptures that these were not all sons. Many servants throughout the Word of God were servants at different levels and different circumstances and times. No, notice this. And here's, here's, here's a lie. Here's, a, here, here's a, a lie that the enemy will say. Here's what the enemy says. We're all children of God. We're all children of God. Yes, we are. We are all deemed to be sons. But not all of us are redeemed. We, it's not enough to be a, 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 a son. Jesus said it this way when he was talking to the, scri the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. They said, we have Abraham to our father. He said, well, if you were, uh, was of Abraham's seed, you would do the works of Abraham. So, uh, I, I, I am by my creation, I am deemed to be a son of God, but that does not mean I am redeemed. Amen. Because I have a fallen nature. I, 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 I must repent of my sin. I have chosen my, my father before me and his father before him walked in sin. And we all have to uh, find repentance in an altar and, and, and redirect our lives and say, God, I want to get back to the God. And I want to get back, amen, to where you want me to be. I want to walk in order. I want my life to be ordered by the Lord. I want my, the Word of God to direct my footsteps. Amen. Amen. He says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall be saved. There are levels of that. You know, oh, I'm a son of God. Really? Well, are you living like well, I, you know, I, I have Abraham to my father. Are you doing the works of Abraham? Uh, no. Uh, I call him Lord, but I don't live like he's Lord of my life. Follow me one day and you'll find out who my Lord is. Amen. And, and so he said, not everybody that says they're my son is my son. That's basically what he's saying. Amen. Not everyone that says they're living for God actually are. Many today are saying this, but all the while what is actually happening is that in their heart, they're more interested in being religious and appearing to be right. See, there's a lot of people that are more, more uh, concerned about appearances than they are actual facts. Uh, as long as they can appear to be right, as long as they can appear to have a walk with God, as long as they can appear that they have got it all together, that's all they want. But behind that wall, <laughs> behind that wall is a relationship you can have with God where you're not thinking about appearances. You're talking about, you're thinking about reality. Lord, I just don't want to appear to be saved. I want to be saved. I don't want to have the appearance of being right. I want to be right. Amen. I don't want to deceive my own self. Amen. You know, I made one thing I made up my mind is as a young boy, because I had tried religion as a young boy, and I, I was very disappointed with religion. Religion is something that uh, it, it, religion cannot save a gnat. Now, the Bible, Paul tells us what true religion is. We know what the true religion is. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this man-made stuff out here that says you can proclaim to do one thing and do something else. 
I, I, the only thing is that what, the only important thing being in religious is what you say, not what you do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, like uh, my daddy used to say, "Don't do as I do; do as I say do." Well, that don't work. I, that don't work. My daddy was an alcoholic, but he wanted to beat me half to death if I took a drink. You know, and I understand he wanted to protect me from being like him. But how much greater would it have been if he'd have gave his heart to God and didn't drink? And I had an example to follow. Amen? Hallelujah? I've said it before. My mom and dad were absolutely wonderful examples of who I did not want to be. See, every one of us are an example whether you want to be or not. Your children are watching you. Sir, your wife is watching you. Your grandchildren are watching you. And what are they learning about you? What do they see when they look at daddy? What do they see when they look at grandpa? Oh, let me tell you, these little children can see right through you when you fake it. These little children can see right through you when you profess one thing and live something else. Oh, how much sweeter would it be to have a true walk with God? How much sweeter would it be, hallelujah, to have a heart that's fixed on serving God and living for God? I'm not interested in appearance. I'm interested in being right. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. They had to make a decision on the seventh year. Now, I don't believe that decision that was made by these people was something that happened at the moment. They had thought about it. It was a calculated thing. Now, just think about it. If you're in, if, if you're in uh, uh, slavery and you've got a, a seven-year contract and, and then you're into the sixth year, you're fixing to go, you, you, you're thinking, whoo, man, I just got a few more days and I'm out of here. And so they're laying on their cot and they're thinking about this thing. Man, they're thinking about, man, I'm telling you what, I've only got two more weeks. And in two more weeks, I'm going to get my, 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 my goods, my cattle, my sheep, whatever the master's going to give me. And I'm going to boogity boogity. I'm going to go on down the road and, I, and I'm going to start a new life. And I'm going to find uncle so-and-so and brother so-and-so and let them know, hey, I'm here and it's going to be all right. So they calculated this. But there also there was those that laid on their bed at night knowing that they had to make a decision and they weren't too sure about what they were going to do. And then ultimately, they figured out exactly what they were going to do. Amen. They knew that day was coming, so some planted on leaving. You know, uh, uh, there was a man that sang, leaving on my mind. You know, some people come with leaving on their mind. Amen. They, 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 don't, they, don't, uh, they don't have nothing in their mind that's talking about staying. Praise God. Amen. They're temporary people. They're like a fly. They're here today. They're gone tomorrow, you know, and they're going to light on something else. So they're, they're, there's no stability in them. They're here, there, they're here, there, here, there. Amen. But, but you know, that there's others of us that made up in our mind, amen, to be consistent in our walk with God. Amen. And so they... Have got this, and the and they they are are facing the day, amen, amen. So that day is coming. They possibly had others on the outside of the master's house that they were unwilling to separate themselves from. Attachments to the world, attachments attachments out there will always have a pull on us, amen. The scripture says that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom, and he wound up in Sodom. Whatever you look at, whatever you gaze at, will be your destination. I like what John Maxwell said. He said, whatever you focus on will expand. Whatever you focus on, ministry, walk with God, it's all about focus. If you focus on living for God, you will live for God. If you focus on growing in the Lord, you will grow in the Lord. But if your focus is here and there and here and there and here and there, your emotions will take you different ways and you'll be like a cloud. You'll be like a, 
a, a vapor that's moved with every wind of doctrine and with every swing of your, of your emotions. You will be an unstable individual. Amen. Sodom called for Lot and he answered the call. The problems that had brought them to the master's house and caused them to sell themselves in the first place are all better now and some are ready to leave. And so he says to himself, it's time to leave. And remember, I can leave with blessings. He's going to give me some blessings and I'm going to be able to go on down the road and I am going to go. And the master is going to let me go. Amen. And it was a day that found them all there. It was a valley. It was a day of decision. Knowing that I have the freedom to walk away or stay. Can I say it today to every one of us? You gotta, you got, you're free today to walk away or stay. There's nobody got you chained in here. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. But we made up in our mind to stay. We made up in our mind to do it God's way. We made up in our mind to surrender and say, God, I love you. I love you. Amen. I'm here in the master's house and things and circumstances brought me here. Amen. Oh, but I need to, you know, I remember Mark Hanby preached a message years ago. He said, what did you promise God when you were in trouble? We need to take inventory on those things. Amen. And here's the fact, my brother and sister, as long as you have options in your heart, you will never really serve God. If you've got options, you're always going to be torn and you're going to be unstable. But if you have no option, you have sold out to live for God. Living for God is the simplest thing you'll ever do. Praise God. It's an issue that must be settled once and for all. John 6, 66 said, For that many... For that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They were servants for a time. They were servants for a time. The next verse then said, Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? The next verse, then Simon Peter answered him, said, Lord, to whom shall we, well, to whom shall we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. There's nowhere else to go, brother. Amen. Sink or swim, good, bad, in the ugly. I am in the house of God. Hallelujah for the rest of my days. I have sold out to live for God. Are we perfect? Not on your life. Hey, listen. Is your family perfect? God had two kids in the garden. Both of them went bad. How about your family? You got a perfect family? Come on, don't be lying in the house of God. Amen. None of our families are perfect. We're striving to do better. But why do we look for perfection in the church? This is the family of God. This is the children of God. And the children of God are just like your children. Sometimes your children act like a brat. Sometimes your children break your heart. Sometimes you're proud of what they do. You don't throw your children away. You don't go find a new family because you don't throw them away and say, I'm going to get me a new son. I'm going to get me a new daughter. No, because you love them. It's the same thing with the house of God. If you want to find fault with this pastor, you'll find it. His wife is taught him. If you want to find fault, if that's what you're looking for, you're going to see it. <laughs> hey, but, but if you look at the pastor and his wife and his daughter and say, listen, this is my brother. This is my sister. Hey, Amen. We're all struggling to be more like the Lord. <laughs> hey, but none of us are perfect. Then when a, when, a, when a false prophet comes your way and tries to pull you away from this church, you're not going to listen because there's no perfection over there either. Amen. Amen. I made up in my mind, hallelujah, to be stable. I made up in my mind to live for God. I made up in my mind I'm going to be here with no, amen, when the Lord comes back. 
Praise God. Amen. Amen. There's no options. Amen. You know, I thought about living for God sometimes like being in a boat. The waves get high. The winds blow so hard sometimes you get seasick. And you know, I was raised on the ocean. And you know, uh, you know, I, I've been on some boats when the, I mean, I'm telling you, the water was coming in the boat. But I never got to the place where I said, you know, I think I'll jump out. Jaws is waiting on you. Hey, it may be taking on water, but it's still better than getting in the water. Amen. The church may not be perfect, but it's still better than what's out there. Amen. Hallelujah. And whenever the church takes on a little water, you know what you need to do? You need to get you a bucket and get... Hey! Hey! Glory to God. We're all in this thing together. Amen. 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 Because if you jump out of the boat, there's no hope for you. There's something out there in that water saying, yum, yum. <laughs> Come on out of that boat, son. So does it make a lot of sense? Oh, Lord. Uh, the, the, uh, this church is not perfect. I'm going to go find me another, uh, find me a perfect church. You're never going to find that. So what you do, you jump over and say, oh, praise God, I'm not in that boat no more. I'm not in that boat no more, no, but you're in something smelly. How long can you tread water, baby? I'm telling you, no matter what we have to struggle with, because we're humans, it's always better to be in the boat than outside the boat. Don't look perfect for perfection in your pastor, in your brother. Don't look for perfect for perfection. You don't look for it in yourself, do you? Uh, I've met so many people that can find everybody's faults but their own. Well, they shouldn't do that. So, you know, that one shouldn't do this. And that one should Well, how about you? How about you? How about you? Yes. How about you? Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're seeing what you want to see. We talked about covering a couple of few weeks ago. We need to learn how to cover some things. We need to intercede for our brothers and sisters. Because, no, they may not have it all together where you've got it together, but you don't have it together where they've got it together. An iron sharpeneth iron. And that, you, don't, you notice that? I want you to look, think about that analogy. Iron sharpeneth iron. Each piece has to give up something. Each piece has to give up something. But we don't want to give up nothing. But we need to learn how to give up things and love my brother and love my sister, but most importantly, be submissive to my God. Amen. Amen. There are no options for us. We have chosen to serve God. Amen. Amen. So how is it in the master's house for you? Evidently, you've made up in your mind to stay. Amen. And uh, here they are. They, the, this day finally comes. And, uh, uh, and they are faced with a decision. And, uh, <laughs> and here they are. And their name is called. And they say, uh, 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 Steve Crow, come forth. And now... There's a decision to be made. Steve Crow will proclaim, what do you want to do today? Do you want your liberty? Do you want to be set free to go your own way? Or do you choose to stay in the master's house? And 
if he says, no, I want to go, then there's no hard feelings. There's no none of that. We give you your, 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 your severance and, and now you go on your way. But if Steve Crow was to say, no, I've thought about this for a long time. You know, the, uh, the, the master has been good to me. I remember six years ago when I came here, my life was tore up. I didn't have anything. My, my, my mind, my marriage, everything was in a wreck. Uh, now it's all back together. And I owe that to the master. I, I owe that to the master. And I'm not going to leave here. I want to stay in the house of God. And if Steve Crow says, no, I don't want to go. I've made up my mind to stay. Then there is an emotional thing that takes place and the master takes Steve Crow by the hand and leads him over to the doorpost. And while there is tears flowing down both of them's face, this man puts his ear to the doorpost and a all is taken and a all is rammed through the ear of that servant. This is not a hole for something to be put in. It is a hole of demarcation. It is, a, is a, it is a hole that whenever he goes into the city tomorrow, everybody will know he is not just a slave. He is a love slave. This man, Paul said it this way. He said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said to present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. And I'm telling you, until God, and until you allow God to affect your flesh, the whole thing's not complete yet. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Flesh that is submitted to God is a sign of maturity in your walk with God. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody can talk it, but not everybody can walk it. Amen. And so, look, he's got a mark on his body. There's a mark in his ear. And everybody that sees him from this day forward, they notice that mark. They notice that, that wound. They notice that scab. They notice these things. And they say, this man is a love slave. Yeah. Praise God. Present your body. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm not here tonight because I don't have anywhere else to go. I'm not here tonight because I'm bored. I'm not here tonight because there's not, my favorite movie is not on the television tonight. I am here because of duty. I am here because of love. Amen. And if you don't know it, let me, let me fill in a little blank for some of you that may not know it. You know, preachers preach this stuff, but preachers have to do this too. Well, we don't preach one thing and do something else. Whatever this man of God wants you to do, he's doing it himself. His family is doing this. You, 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 don't, you don't outgrow obedience. You don't outgrow godliness. Amen. I, I send my tithe back home to my home church that my son is pastoring. Every month, every month, I, I pay my tithe back to the home church. Amen. Praise God. I'm not going to preach one thing and do something else. Amen. I'm in the same boat as you are. Hey Amen. There's a mark in my life. And that's the reason why I'm here. On Wednesday nights, when we don't have nowhere to go, you know what I'm, I'm sitting in Brother Connor's church. Me and my wife, we know when it comes to Wednesday night, Sunday, we're going to be in the house of God. It, it, it's not none of this stuff. Well, it's church time. We're going to go tonight. What kind of stuff is that? Well, it's Wednesday night. Uh, honey, are we going to go to church tonight or not? 
What? That's not even a question. Let me tell you. Let me ask you. He died for your soul. And all he asked out of you is four or five hours a week and you think that's too much? Come on. Now I'm not talking about not living for God at home. You got to do that. But I'm talking about some of us think, some of us act like we deserve a gold medal just because we come to church twice a week. Man, praise God. Praise God. I, I'm here. But well, my God, come on now. You could be in a bar room. You could be laying out here in the, uh, on the side of the sidewalk with drugs. Drugs. Your family could be torn apart. You, you, you could. Oh, you could. Oh, God, there's so many things that you could be doing out here. But no, you're in the house of safety. And oh, my God, we owe it to Him to be faithful. We owe it to God to be faithful. Amen. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, I'll tell you, you know, we, we talk a lot about the mark of the beast. But there's a mark of God. Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, there is a beautiful chapter to read there. There is sin going on in Israel. There is debauchery everywhere. And God is sending judgment. And God says this. He said, I'm tired of it. Judgment's coming. And I want you to begin at my house. Now, now uh, uh, please. I, uh, Pastor, this is, my, this, is, this is the way I believe. And, 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 and if this is, I, I want you to correct me. Sometimes we use that scripture and say, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Like the sins that you create committed before you come to God are in a different category than the sins that you commit after you come to God. In other words, I can get forgiveness as long as I did that before I came to God. But if I fail God or sin after I came to God, now that's going to be held against me. Yes. That's false doctrine. That's right. That's right. Forgiveness is forgiveness. Yes, it is. Whether you did it before you come to the Lord, right. after you come to the Lord. Right. Amen. We all need a Savior. Yes, what He was meaning is, here's what He was saying. I am not going to judge the world and exempt my church. I'm not going to wink at my church's sin and judge a world for their sin. And so when judgment comes, it begins at the house of God. It begins with me and you in ministry. Amen. This is a fearful, a trembling thing. Amen. It's an awesome reverence that we must take into fact and do account that God, when He when He meets, meets out judgment, is going to begin in the house of God. And so he says. There's sin everywhere. There's debauchery everywhere. And he tells the angels, he said, I want you to go and smite. 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 Kill every one of them. Because they're so evil. He said, but I want you to begin at my house. Oh, Jesus. What a sobering thought. He said, but wait a minute, angels. I'm paraphrasing. Don't do anything to them that I've put a mark on. Matter of fact, you're going to put a mark on them. Those that weep and sigh over the abomination that they see. Those that are in the altar. Those that are, are weeping and crying because they want God to come and, and heal their land and heal their nation. When you come upon a man or a woman that's a prayer warrior, when you come across somebody that is weeping and sighing for the abomination that they see, he said, I want you to put a mark on them. 
And I don't, I want you to spare everyone that I have marked. Oh, the mark of God. The mark of God. The mark of God. I'm not worried about the mark of the beast. You can ask a hundred different people what that is and you'll get a hundred different answers. I don't know. But I do know what the mark of God is. The mark of God is a pure heart. The mark, the mark of God is being tender in God's presence. The mark of God is having a right spirit. The mark of God is a submitted soul. Amen. God... Mark me. Mark me. Brother he Brother Tenney used to say, if you were convicted, if you was accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Are we right with God? Are we marked for life? Have we made up in our mind that no matter, what, no matter what happens to the United States of America, I'm going to serve the Lord. No matter if our nation turns into a socialist nation, some would argue we're already there. Amen. No matter what happens to our government, no matter who is the president, no matter who is the governor, I done made up in my mind I'm going to serve the Lord. <laughs> it's not going to affect my law with God. It's not going to affect that. Because my commitment to God has nothing to do with my existence in the world. I'm in the world, but not of it. So God, I ask you one more time to speak to every heart in this house right now. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, if it's been a long time since we visited the doorpost, if it's been a long time since we thought about going to the doorpost, God, bring to our memory and to our, our consciousness, O oh Lord, that I have made up my mind to serve God. Lord, I ask you to stir up our pure hearts. Stir up our minds, oh God, and let us understand and let us know that this is a true love story. Oh, it's not enough that Jesus loves me. I've got to love Jesus. Hallelujah. I want this love story to be complete. I want to be able to know that he loves me and I love him. If you was to take the entire Bible and you was, con was to condense it into one or two phrases, it would be this. Adam, go back to the garden. Adam, I want you to go back to the place where it was so simple. Where it was just me and you walking in the garden. You talked to me and I talked to you. Everything was so simple and so beautiful. And that's where God wants to take every one of us. He wants us to take us back to the garden. We lost that. And now we are redeemed and we can go back and spend time with him alone walk with him alone in the cool of the day notice he notice the lord said in the cool of the day god loved abraham ate adam so much that he did it when it was convenient for him he accommodated adam he said, Adam, I want to talk to you. I want to spend time with you. And because you're flesh, we'll do it in the cool of the day. I just want to talk to you, Adam. And Adam says, Lord, I want to talk to you. All that matters is my relationship with him. 